Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Salve YouTube, sum tapardino et linguam latinum dico, nunc vobis octo creatores novas abeo ex planeta almaisha, fruimini eos. Okay, first up we have the barrel dactyl. Barrel dactyls have given up their ancestral filter feeding for a life of ambush predation, and with it they have become smarter, better coordinated, and better at seeing incoming prey. Pictured here in the foreground, a barrel dactyl descends a rock face looking for more prey, while in the background, another attempts to attack an Umtrabella. Creature design by Dapper Dino. Starting to target larger and larger prey has led to strong selection pressure in barrel dactyls. As a result, they have developed a cartilaginous skeleton with numerous joints. At the aboral end are five legs with three joints each. Each leg segment is supported by a rod of stiff cartilage. Above this is a hip-like structure called the calathiscium, which supports the weight of the internal organs and provides muscle attachment sites for the proximal segments of the legs. Above the calathiscium and surrounding the nerve bundles that run from each of the five brain ganglia to the eyes, respiratory orifices, legs, and arms, are cartilaginous tubes called paranotochords, which protect the nerves as well as providing additional support to the respiratory reproductive tract, the eyes, and the upper limbs. Each eye now contains a muscular sphincter which allows it to focus and adapt to differing light levels. The respiratory reproductive organs are generally very similar to those of the ancestral feather barrel, although muscle attachments to the paranotochords allow them to be more finely and strongly controlled. So, like the sea tumbleweed, a barrel dactyl can make surprisingly fast getaways using the tubes midway down its body as quick water jets. Lining the oral end of the creature are ten feeding arms, each with four segments supported by stiff cartilage and bearing two chitinous claws at their distal end. These limbs are supported by a series of five radial skeletal elements called the ossa pectorum circularia, singular os pectus circulare. Each sits directly above an eye and supports two arms with muscle attachment points. Within the oral end of the central digestive cavity are several hard calcified teeth, and the whole area is lined by three separate sphincters which can constrict the oral orifice to help process food. The sphincters are arranged one on top of each other along the oral aboral axis. Like the ancestral feather barrels and sea tumbleweed, barrel dactyls have essentially five brains, each consisting of a cluster of ganglia that sit medial to the eyes and which extend nerve clusters orally, aborally, and around the circumference of the organism to connect to other ganglia clusters. Barrel dactyls are one of the few species that have trended towards case selection on Almaisha. Around the northern vernal equinox, males will begin to seek out mates. If two or more encounter the same female, they will push each other around while threateningly waving their feeding arms. These shoving matches rarely result in injury, but the stronger male will generally force a retreat in any other males, and then he and the female will mate. The female will remove five large eggs, each from one respiratory outlet orifice, which will then be fertilized by the male by expelling milt over them. The eggs are sticky and are pushed into a crevice in a rock. After an hour or so, they will exude a cement similar to that used by the ancestral feather barrel to adhere its roots to the substrate. These eggs are guarded by both parents who will take turns going out to hunt and guarding the eggs. When the eggs hatch, the juveniles emerge at about five centimeters tall, excluding the feeding arms. They are miniature versions of the adult, but with pink skin. When young, they will feed on small organisms they can catch, as well as regurgitated food from both parents. While below 15 centimeters in height, excluding the feeding arms, they are quite agile in the water, swimming with jets from their respiratory reproductive tract. As the juveniles age, their skin darkens, and when they reach approximately 20 centimeters in height, again excluding the feeding arms, they are expelled from the family group. Barrel dactyls live in the Yamanataj major reef system, as well as in rocky intertidal regions around Yama and Kupshai. Barrel dactyls are ambush predators who hide in rock crevices and in stands of sea grasso. They take prey up to 10 centimeters long by stabbing it with feeding claws, dragging it to their mouths, and then further shredding their prey with their teeth. Barrel dactyls typically make most of their diet up in nectonic xenosegmentins and slow-moving phytozoans. With a newfound ability to focus and change the amount of light entering the eyes, the barrel dactyl has extremely keen vision. Further, enhancements in communication between ganglia have given the barrel dactyl 360 binocular vision. This is vital as the eyes cannot see directly above the organism, but this is where it feeds so it must keep track of the speed, direction, and distance of targets so that it can predict when they are in range of its clawed feeding arms. This has also come with a significant advancement in neural processing power, and barrel dactyls are some of the smartest creatures to evolve by this time, although by modern Earth standards they are still rather dumb, being not much smarter than a goldfish. Genetic ancestor? Sea tumbleweed. Scientific name? Arthrodactyl lithoraptor. Origin? Xenoradiata. Lifespan? 
five local years. Average height, 30 centimeters, excluding feeding arms. Body tint. Barrel dactyls have dark colored skin over most of their body that helps them blend in with the rocks they live on and among. They also often have irregular purple patches on their skin that resemble the color of a patch of retinal fight growth to further camouflage them. All right, next up we come to the bar snail. In the warm waters of ancient al a strange looking retinal fight sways in the sunlit summer current. This strange plant, a stalk supporting two bars, rests upon a light blue-gray rock perched up among the sargrasso near the shores of Kupshai. Nearby, a juvenile Magnospina forages for food amongst the sargrasso stalks. The juvenile was recently born and is no longer than three centimeters. A vulnerable organism, it carefully keeps watch to avoid being ambushed by the many predators in the ecosystem. Slowly, it crawls along the ocean floor, searching for small sargrasso leaves to consume. It is then that it spots a strange retinal fight, looming over with its strange stalks. Along the base rests eight small, budding sargrasso leaves, no longer than a centimeter or so, gently twitching and swaying in the current. Bathed in the summer sun, the purple leaves almost seem to glisten in the light. The temptation of easy food compels the baby Magnuspina to move towards the stone, which almost seems to unnaturally rise up from the ground. Above, two small green patches slowly emerge, revealing four line-shaped pupils homing in on the Magnospina. As the eyes focus, the strange creature hones in on its next meal. Patiently, it waits for its prey to enter striking distance, carefully watching its every footstep as it slowly inches closer to the predator's jaws. As the Magnospina finally reaches its meal, it stops and takes one final look around. A strange sense of danger builds up as the Magnospina momentarily senses that something is amiss. It quickly scans the surrounding area for an ambush predator lying in wait, but no movement amongst the Sargrasso would indicate anything of the sort. In fact, it would seem that it is alone. Satisfied, the Magnospina takes a bite into the Sargrasso, or at least attempts to, for as its mandibles open around the leaf, a burst of movement begins all around it. The unfortunate juvenile failed to notice the opening of a round, jawless mouth lined with serrated silicate teeth above it, and in just a few moments the Magnospina was pounced upon and forced into its stomach. Defenseless, the Magnuspina is helpless to prevent itself from being ripped apart by a long, serrated tongue and mouth as it is torn to pieces and devoured by the strange alien predator. Pictured is Xenobiology 1's Sean Ring's painting of this scene. Creature design, creature design by Lethal Cuteness. Geobares, also called the bar snail, is a strange type of cephaloptin lurking among the retinal fights of Almaish's oceans. Externally, while clearly a cephaloptin, its relation to other organisms within the clade is difficult to pinpoint. One might expect, for instance, this organism to be closely related to the horn snails and Chilifoichthians. However, upon examination of their digestive gland, one would find they are actually closely related to Esoterichians. Like all cephaloptins, the bar snails have a certain set of defining characteristics which clearly show them as part of the clade. Along the center of the organisms exists a stem which runs from the base of the head tagma to the tail bones, which it joins with to form the anchor point for the tail. This is what defines them as closer to Esoterike, as these two groups are the only cephaloptins to have evolved this trait so far. Just beneath the stem rests a stomach, digestive gland, long tubular intestine, a blood-filled cavity which extends into tubular structures lined with muscle that travel through the body, and two gonads, one male and one female. The stem serves as the anchor point for four long blocks of muscles which serve as the controlling muscles for the limbs. The limbs themselves are quite bony, each consisting of seven bones arranged into a pyramid pointed towards the insides of the body with tiny muscle blocks between them to provide flexibility and gripping power. Along the stem are two long nerves running the entire length of the body, which intersect at each limb pair and at the ends of the stem. Connected to these are two pairs of statocysts, which help the organism know how its body is oriented in the water. Beyond this point, however, the bar snails begin to significantly differentiate themselves from other cephaloptins. The tail tagma has changed significantly, and now often takes the form of a large, flat, muscular, foot-like structure resembling what is seen in numerous species of mollusks on Earth. The foot is able to anchor the organism to a perch, so it may rear its body up vertically. The muscle blocks between the bones and the fins have expanded significantly at the expense of the bones, granting the fins greater flexibility. However, the most changes to the anatomy have occurred within the head and skin. The head tagma is, in and of itself, the species' most striking feature. The head tagma has elongated significantly, with two pairs of eye stalks emerging, one at the front of the head and one in the middle. However, they are quite flexible and will usually appear to sway in the water. The mouth has elongated significantly and now runs from the second eye pair all the way up to the base of the head. The radula has swelled significantly and the odontophore now extends to the stem. The esophagus has also expanded and now possesses additional muscle blocks dedicated to expanding and contracting the oral cavity. The radula has also seen musculature-related changes as it now possesses a long muscular hydrostat, connecting it to the odontophore, granting it significantly more mobility. 
Within the cranial tagma, the singular statocyst pair has been replaced by 12 statocysts arranged along the cranial tagma in places of importance, three along the top bar, five along the bottom bar, one pair between the bar, and one pair at the base of the cranial tagma. These statocysts have an elevated number of cilia hairs lining the interior, increasing their sensitivity about 200%, as compared to both the others in their bodies. Their nervous system has seen some improvements as well. Optical nerves extending from their four eyes to their brain have swelled, and a large cluster of neurons has formed in the cranial tagma dedicated entirely to processing visual information. This primitive brain, while simple in nature, possesses the ability to perform stereopsis when the eyes are oriented correctly. A valuable trait for a predator. Similar structures exist within the eye stalks. However, these structures also possess the ability to intimately understand information coming from the many statocysts. This type of nervous system is comparable to that seen in the octopus and allows the eye stalks to react to stimuli and move themselves in such a way as to replicate retinal fights with extreme accuracy, precision, and speed, something that would not be possible without autonomy from the primitive brain. The digestive gland has also undergone changes related to the predatory lifestyle, and the bar snail no longer possesses the ability to break down retinal fight material of any kind. Rather, its enzymes have specialized to specifically target xenometazoan proteins, resulting in more efficient digestion at the expense of dietary flexibility. Furthermore, the bar snail's digestive gland is also capable of producing enzymes essential for the glyoxalate cycle, an alternative to the citric acid cycle focused on converting fatty acids into carbohydrates, enabling them to utilize fatty acids in gluconeogenesis, thus significantly aiding in their ability to regulate glucose levels in their bloodstream without relying on the breaking down of proteins. This adaptation is also present in basal esoterichians, however, to a much lesser extent, thus explaining that esoterichians who utilize the glyoxalate cycle and the bar snail both possess the necessary enzymes ancestrally. Like other cephaloptins, bar snails are diploid hermaphrodites with seasonal mating behaviors. While mostly solitary organisms, bar snails will gather in groups during the summer months to mate. When conditions have become optimal for eggs, usually warm waters with longer days, usually warm waters with days longer than half the average local day-night cycle, the bar snail will begin to excrete pheromones from its posterior anus that are produced by the gonads. These pheromones can be carried through the water and detected from up to several kilometers away, resulting in large congregations of bar snails ranging from 20 to 200 individuals. Once the organisms gather, they will begin to use the chromatophores on their head tagma to create vivid color displays to attempt to impress another member of the species. In general, the healthier bar snails will be able to produce more vivid, intricate color patterns and will thus have a greater chance of impressing a mate. Once a pair of bar snails have chosen each other, they will then lay about 10 eggs in a small mucosal sac before fertilizing the others and carrying it off with them. The bar snail will then wander until it finds a suitable hunting perch. Once it has found one, it will place the egg sac in a place a short distance away and perch itself to hunt. It will watch the egg sac from its perch while hunting and will protect the egg sac until it hatches. The bar snail naiads hatch after about 7 to 14 local days and emerge from their eggs as miniature adults. The largest of them is only 5 millimeters long. These organisms are not large enough to freely swim or crawl and spend this portion of their lives at the mercy of the current. As they cannot hunt at this time, they have a small yolk from their eggs connected to their stomach. Other than this and the underdevelopment of the gonads, there are no differences between them and the adult organism besides size. The naiad will continue to be at the mercy of the currents for the first week of their life, by the end of which they will reach the size of 2 centimeters. At this point, if they have not figured out the basics of hunting or foraging for food, they will die as their yolks run out. Once they reach this size, they will first feed on mycoids among the substrate before reaching a size large enough to go after larger prey. Fortress mesas are among the most common prey for a juvenile bar snail, and remain so for the entirety of this phase of life. Once the bar snail reaches the size of about 12 to 15 centimeters, it enters the adolescent phase of its life. During this phase, it will begin to hunt larger prey, such as megaspina hatchlings, and is functionally identical to an adult, with one key difference. A bar snail of this age is not sexually mature, in fact, it is during this phase that its gonads will only begin to develop, and will not fully develop until the completion of this phase. Once this development completes, the bar snail is fully developed and enters the adult stage of its life. It will attempt to mate and survive for the remainder of its life. Overall, this entire process takes approximately 90 local days to complete, and most naiads will not survive to reach adolescence. As a general rule for the species, the highest chance of death is the juvenile stage. Passing through this phase into adolescence, on average, asserts survival into adulthood. Overall, about 70% of naiads born will not make it past this phase, leaving roughly 28% on average to survive into adulthood and mate. An average of 2% die during the adolescent phase, significantly lower than either of the other two phases. The bar snail inhabits shallow environments along the coastlines of Kubshai, southern Yama, and southern Arctica. These organisms blend in with retinal fights by making use of their chromatophores and flexible head tagma to lure in and ambush small herbivorous animals. 
The bar snail, uniquely amongst baseless cephaloptans, is exclusively a carnivorous organism. This has naturally necessitated numerous adaptations to the consumption of other organisms, most notably adaptations to the radula and digestive gland. However, this has come at the cost of a significant increase in rigidity regarding nutritional demands. The bar snail specifically gains the vast majority of its nutrients from fats, and as such prefers organisms that possess high concentrations of fat within their bodies. However, carbohydrates can be extracted through the breaking down of proteins into amino acids, which subsequently can be inserted into the citric acid cycle to allow gluconeogenesis without the input of fatty acids. While this is feasible, it is far more preferable for the bar snail to consume fatty organisms, as these proteins can be more efficiently used to repair and generate new tissues, as opposed to synthesizing glucose to maintain proper glucose levels in their circulatory system. Their preferred food includes magnospina and megacarid hatchlings, unlucky juvenile bullpeds, rose limpets, and small armor globes. Of these, rose limpets and juvenile bullpeds are the most reliable, with megacarid and magnospina hatchlings being less reliable prey. Small armor globes can prove particularly challenging due to their armor, however this can be overcome by gnawing at the gaps between armored plates, where the soft flesh is exposed and able to be lacerated by the radula. Bar snails are, like most other cephaloptans, visually based organisms. In the case of the bar snail, several key advancements have been made to help give the species a competitive edge in their ecosystems. Their eye stalks possess their own complex neuron clusters, enabling them to effectively think and act autonomously from the brain. This allows the processing of immediate data quickly and efficiently, without taxing the central brain. The central brain itself is mostly swelled as a response to the needs of comparing visual information from four separate locations, as well as to process and keep track of the orientation of its numerous body parts. Handling this information accurately is crucial to blending in and disguising itself as a retinal fight. The central brain, therefore, is responsible for performing seriopsis when able, controlling the movements of the body and tail tagma, and ensuring the smooth coordination of the eye stalks, ensuring that the organism blends into its habitat and is able to attract prey. Genetic ancestor, Xenoyuli kirbii. Scientific name, Diobaris diopicta. Origin, Xenosegmenta. Lifespan, three local years. Average height, eight centimeters. Average length, 20 centimeters. Now we come to the pudge worm. Crawling among the sediment of ancient Almatia is a small worm-like creature with legs. Its body is small and simple, as is its lifestyle. As it slowly filters the sediment along the seafloor, it wiggles its body in a caterpillar-like motion, gripping the rocks and sand with its tiny, bony fins. The creature itself is fairly strange. While it clearly shows vestigial signs of segmentation, and repeating opsin clusters like a xenosegmentin, it also has a body plan resembling that of a paleotagmaton. With its four camera-type eyes, it looks around the water column, observing its surroundings and watching for predators, burrowing itself deep into the ground at the sight of danger. While it may not seem like a particularly important organism to an observer, its discovery was actually one of the most significant in terms of the study of ancient Almaitia. In fact, this tiny organism is a basal member of the clade of organisms known as cephaloptins. Thus, this discovery was one of the most important for the study of the clade, as well as the study of evolution as a whole, as the pudge worm is one of the closest animals to the common ancestor of a clade on Almaitia discovered thus far, and the study of its anatomy has led to important breakthroughs and insights on the evolution of the strange xenosegmentins that make up the clade Cephaloptena. Pictured here, a pudgeworm inches its way across some sand looking for a new hiding place. Creature designed by Lethal Cuteness. Now for the anatomy section, Lethal Cuteness provided a handy diagram, so we're going to reference it. This anatomical diagram shows some of the important organs of the pudgeworm, which are referenced and explained in greater detail below. Bright red, cranial neuron cluster. Yellow, esophagus. Azure blue, Tinidia, internal gill structures shaped like feathers. Purple, odontophore, bony plate that anchors the radula located dorsally. Dark orange, radula, rasping tongue-like structure that is lined with small keratin teeth. Aqua. Eyes. Dark yellow, statocysts, small pouches with fluid, measures direction of gravity. Light brown slash sand. Stomach. Rust orange, digestive gland. Pink, tubular intestine. Light orange, stem, notochord-like structure. Dark brown, gonads. Gray, cartilaginous bones, not shown on cranial tagma due to size. Clear, hemocele, central cavity of the circulatory system. Green, locomotive muscles. The pudgeworm's anatomy is fairly basal, yet it differs considerably from most other xenosegmentins, indicating that the divergence of cephaloptins from other xenosegmentins is quite ancient. Its external anatomy can be divided into three distinct tagma. The cranial tagma consists of organs regarding sensory information, most notably the eyes. It is also responsible for the intake of materials from the environment into the body. The abdominal tagma contains most internal organs essential to life, such as the central circulatory system, digestive tract, and most muscle groups responsible for locomotion. 
The posterior tagma contains the posterior anus and the gonads and is responsible for materials exiting the body and being released into the environment. The cranial tagma consists of the merged segments 1 and 2 present on Xenoyuli Kirby. Externally, the fin-like appendages remain present, however most are vestigial. Despite this, they still contain the same number of cartilaginous structures present in every other fin, with the exception of the primitive tail fluke. Seven cartilaginous bones are located within these four fins, and lack any connection to the rest of the body via muscle whatsoever. They are maintained by a simple supply of blood, but there is little other connection with the rest of the organism's body. The four eyes of the pudgeworm are descended from the opsum clusters located on the first two segments of more basal Xenoyuli descendants, as well as Xenoyuli itself. Each of these eyes is a camera-type lens eye, capable of moderate resolution up to 40 meters away. These eyes consist of a U-shaped pupil, cornea, retina, lens, ciliary body, iris, and vitreous body. The eyes grow from the skin and body tissue of the pudgeworm during its larval phase, and most closely resemble the eyes of cephalopods on Earth. Likewise, the optical nerve protrudes out of the eye from behind without overlapping any optically sensitive cells, resulting in the lack of a blind spot. The optical nerve leads to a large cluster of neurons located within the dorsal side of the cranial tagma just above the odontophore. This cluster of neurons is not a brain, however it does resemble the early development of one. The cluster of neurons is mainly dedicated to the processing of sensory information from the eyes and statocysts, and disseminates this information to the rest of the nervous system through two long neural cords running on each side of the stem. Below the protobrain rests the oral cavity. Surrounding the exterior side is a set of hydrostatic muscle structures operating as a sort of lip muscle that enables the pudgeworm to seal and open the oral cavity as necessary. Inside of the oral cavity rests a radula, a tongue-like structure lined in numerous small keratin teeth specialized for rasping and scraping material off surfaces. This radula is anchored to a cartilaginous odontophore situated on the roof of the mouth, which enables the radula to move downwards into the oral cavity to scrape up material and grind it within the oral cavity before sending it to the esophagus. This radula likely evolved from filter feeding structures located within Kirby's oral cavity as a benthic lifestyle necessitated this structural modification to allow filter feeding of plant matter from the larger rocks and sediment. Within the cranial tagma exists two statocysts. These organs are small pouches located within the interior of the organism that are lined with cilia hairs. These cilia hairs are in turn connected to highly sensitive nerve endings that detect changes in the environment of these hairs. Within the statocyst is a small amount of fluid, usually hemocyanin diffused into the organ by local extensions of the hemocyl, which always flows into the bottom of the statocyst. As it does so, it triggers vibrations within these small hairs, thus allowing the pudgeworm to know how it is oriented in relation to gravity, and thus always know what direction it is borrowing. The abdominal tagma consists of the space of the organism located between the cranial and posterior tagma, and is responsible for the housing of most organs, the large system of which is the digestive tract. The esophagus, while connected to the cranial tagma, is mostly located within the abdominal tagma, and is usually considered as part of this tagma when discussing cephalopsin anatomy, with some exceptions. The esophagus contains numerous organs, the first two of which are two osphoradia. Each osphoradium is located on an opposite end of the oral cavity, one on the anterior and one on the dorsal side. These osphoradia are used to detect particles within the esophagus. This role is interestingly vital to the pudgeworm for two reasons. The first of these is that the osphoradia enables the pudgeworm to know how well chewed its food is, as well as to know how much more it needs to chew incoming particulate. The second purpose is to allow it to know if any harmful particulate is entering the esophagus via the water column. This function is crucial, as the esophagus also houses another important structure for the pudgeworm, the tenidia. Within the dorsal side of the esophagus exists a large groove, creating a degree of open space at the top of the esophagus. Within this structure is a pair of tenidia, one located on each side of the groove. The tenidia function as internal gill structures and are a unique adaptation of the cephaloptins. It has been proposed that these structures evolved from a combination of the framework of filter feeding structures and blood vessels, but no theories have been proven definitively. At this time, not enough is known about the Kirby's internal anatomy to reach a satisfactory conclusion. What is certain is that the tenidia evolved as a response to the external gill fronds being pressed against the seafloor continuously, thus restricting access to oxygen. Thus, the tenidia and the anterior gill fronds partition the role of a respiratory system. The tenidia's primary function is to bring oxygen into the bloodstream, while the anterior gill fronds main function is to remove CO2 and soluble waste products as efficiently as possible. At the base of the esophagus rests a small valve chamber, which opens into a single chambered stomach. This stomach is the largest organ within the abdominal tagma, and its purpose is to digest both food and waste products into a soluble form. To accomplish this task, the pudgeworm has evolved a large gland attached to the stomach, which produces enzymes and acids required for digestion. This organ is referred to as the digestive gland, as it evolved from a swollen hormonal gland in segment 4 of Xenoyuli Kirby, and its purpose is related to digestion. The back of the stomach is a small groove structure which contains a valve opening. 
This valve opening opens into a long tubular intestinal tract which runs across the remainder of the abdominal and posterior tagma. Within the intestinal tract are numerous symbiotic microbial organisms, such as chemicoids, which aid in the breakdown of dissolved food and particulate to a form that is soluble within the bloodstream. Long passages of porous, folded membranes within the intestinal tract ensure efficient diffusion of resources into the bloodstream so that they may be easily used or disposed of via respiration. Just behind the stomach rests a large cavity within the body. This cavity is referred to as the hemocele. It is the central portion of the pudgeworm's circulatory system. The hemocele is connected to numerous passages that extend throughout the body, all of which are lined with muscular hydrostatic structures dedicated to pushing blood through the passages. While this type of circulatory system is not closed and no form of heart is present, it is sufficient to ensure sufficient nutrient distribution across the pudgeworm's body and intricate muscle structures. Running along the middle of the abdominal tagma and oriented slightly dorsally, a long tubular structure composed of cartilaginous material serves as the anchor point for most of the central musculature. This organ is referred to as the stem and strongly resembles the notochord of the chordates of earth. However, unlike notochords, the stem does not serve as a protective organ for the nervous system in any way, although two neural cords do run parallel to it on either side. Rather, this cord evolved as an anchor for the numerous muscular hydrostatic structures involved in the creature's locomotion as it crawls across the seafloor and extends and bends its body. Running parallel to the stem on each flanking side, two long neural cords run from the protobrain to the cranial tagma to the end of the stem at the base of the abdominal tagma. These nerve cords serve as the central rootway for information to be sent across the body. Information from the statocysts attach to the cords between each pair of limbs root their information through these cords, as does information collected by the protobrain. This information is then utilized as a means of reacting to stimuli at a fairly instinctive level. The purpose that these long cords serve is quick and efficient root way for reactions to be sent across the organism's body. While these reactions are still heavily instinctive and the pudgeworm lacks learning capacities to any extent beyond the most basic levels, the efficiency of the nerve cord allows complex responses to stimuli to be carried out based on instinctive reactions across the body. The abdominal tagma also contains a vast degree of musculature. The pudgeworm's musculature is based almost entirely on muscular hydrostatic structures running all throughout the body. These structures, while primitive, are quite strong and capable of exerting extreme strength by utilizing the stem and bones located within the fins as a means of support. Thus, their innate strength is able to be amplified significantly into powerful gripping, pushing, and pulling muscles that govern the creature's locomotion. Within their posterior tagma exists two organs of note, as this tagma is dedicated to the expulsion of waste and gametes. The intestinal tract connects to the two gonads through small tubular structures that converge at the posterior anus. This posterior anus is almost completely unchanged from that of Xenoyuli kirby, except that it is surrounded by a muscular hydrostatic structure in a similar way to the mouth. The gonads themselves are of different sexes, rendering the pudgeworm a simultaneous hermaphrodite. It possesses one male and one female gonad. The pudgeworm is a diploid hermaphroditic organism. It possesses one male and one female gonad that are functional and produce gametes simultaneously. These organisms lack any form of mating season. Their range is exclusively equatorial. When these organisms accumulate a critical amount of gametes, they will expel them similarly to waste products through the posterior anus. In the case of female gametes, they are laid as clusters of eggs ranging from clutches of 10 to 20. Male gametes are released as small plumes. When a pudgeworm comes across a clutch of eggs, it will place its posterior anus over them and release all of its accumulated male gametes, fertilizing the eggs. The pudgeworm will, interestingly, do this if it discovers a clutch of eggs it laid itself and it is not uncommon for a pudgeworm to lay its own eggs, tunnel away, rediscover its clutch of eggs, and fertilize them itself. This is not intentional. The pudgeworm itself has no way of remembering what clutch of eggs are its own. Thus, because their process is instinctive, they will attempt to fertilize any clutch of eggs they find that belong to their own species. Pudgeworm eggs hatch after about one to two local days, from which small naiads will emerge. These naiads are identical to adults in every way, except for their small size and lack of developed gametes. The naiads are oftentimes about 1 to 2 millimeters in length, however, their strong fins are able to hold them to the sediment. Should they let go, they will certainly die. The pudgeworm naiads will feed on small flakes of detritus and microbes as they rapidly grow. The entire growth of a pudgeworm from 2 millimeters to 1 to 2 centimeters takes only 5 local days. However, the gonads do not reach maturity until 10 local days, after which gametes of both sexes will begin to be produced in large numbers, thus signifying the beginning of adult life. Pudgeworms have very short life expectancies. Most do not live past 60 local days. However, during this time they will often fertilize hundreds of eggs, thus contributing to the overall success and rapid evolution of the species. This is likely the main reason why pudgeworms have evolved so rapidly in Almaitish's oceans. In the amount of time it takes one species to cycle through a generation, pudgeworms have gone through 4 to 10. Thus, while they live short lives, the species is able to breed rapidly and thus produce a favorable climate for rapid evolution. Pudgeworms live around the equatorial waters of eastern Kupchai and also around nearby islands. 
Pudgeworms are benthic generalists and will consume a wide variety of food. Small pockets of chemocoids are consumed to provide symbionts for the intestinal tract, while retinophytes and phytozoans are gnawed at for the source of complex carbohydrates via flakes of their stems and leaves that can be scraped off. Proteins are usually acquired through filter feeding sediment from microbial organisms and alkyl like producers, which are digested as a primary energy and protein source. Additionally, small grains of sediment are ingested to serve as gastroliths, which aid in the digestion of flakes of plant material. Detritus will also be readily consumed, as it is one of the best sources of proteins and lipids for a pudgeworm. Perhaps the most common prey item for pudgeworms are mycoids, which are consumed in bulk by pudgeworms as a ready source of carbohydrates and proteins. In fact, it may be true that the pudgeworm initially evolved to filter mycoids from the sediment. Due to their abundance around carrion, pudgeworms can be found swarming these locations, consuming mycoids and scavenging flakes of meat from the carrion. The pudgeworm has numerous sensory organs. The three most notable are the osphoridia, camera-type eyes, and statocysts. The osphoridia, located within the esophagus, are specialized organs capable of detecting particles within the water column. These organs effectively serve as primitive feeling organs, taste buds, and scent receptors in the form of one organ. While none of these features are well-developed, with the exception of their ability to feel a particulate's existence, their presence indicates the potential for a great deal of sensory detection, if only on a basic level. The camera-type eyes possess enough resolution to create accurate images up to 40 meters away. While this resolution is the most advanced present on Almaysia, the resolution is significant for small benthic borrowing organisms. Thus, the pudgeworm is able to see predators from very long distances away and react accordingly, indicating why superior vision was selected for amongst their ex kirby ancestors. Furthermore, the pudgeworm is one of the few primitive organisms to have developed a camera-type eye so early, thus granting it and its descendants a key advantage over other organisms in their ecosystems. The stenocysts, while some of the smallest sensory organs within their body, are among the most important anatomical features of the pudgeworm. As sight and touch are unreliable for determining direction when underground, an organ to allow an organism to detect what direction it was moving underground was selected for among pudgeworms and their ex kirby ancestors. Thus, several small pockets within the hemocele of Xenoyuli kirby on segments 2, 4, and 7 were separated from the rest of the circulatory system and adapted to be utilized as a type of sensory organ. Cilia hairs were developed Cilia hairs were developed lining the interior and the neurons were attached to the structure. The result was an organ that could be utilized as a means of detecting the direction of gravity, which would allow the organism to differentiate between up and down while underground. Other than these organs, pudgeworms possess a nervous system that is capable of transmitting sensory information from the skin, fins, and some internal anatomical structures through the nervous system. These kinds of sensory information can include temperature and a sense of damage, as well as a basic sense of texture. For instance, if the surface is slippery, smooth, or rigid, but little else. This nervous system is basic, however, it does allow the pudgeworm to gain an understanding of the sediment around it as it digs and searches for food. Pudgeworms oftentimes form symbiotic relationships with benthic layer microbial organisms that they accidentally ingest. Most famous of these are the chemicoids, which rapidly colonize the guts of pudgeworms and feed off the large amounts of sediment that find their way into the digestive tract by accident. These sediments are broken down into a form that can be expelled, and in some cases incorporated into vital compounds within the pudgeworm, such as amino acids, proteins, lipids, enzymes, and other important biological molecules. Scientific name? Thalassia expinata. Origin? Xenosegmenta. Lifespan? 60 local days. Average height? 0.2 centimeters. Average length? 1 centimeter. Now we are at the phytocetacean. Thanks to plankton numbers rebounding higher after the ocean acidification, phytopinnipeds took advantage of that to become larger filter feeders. Pictured here, a pair of phytocetaceans are pursued by one of the few creatures large enough to pose a threat to them, Xenopistris, creature designed by 1674033. With phytocetaceans evolving to eat more plankton, they evolved a rudimentary blind stomach to break down food. The appendages on the front have bristles used to catch plankton in the water. Photosynthesis is still used in phytocetaceans, though it isn't used as much due to phytocetaceans now getting 60% of their energy from plankton. Unlike their phytopinniped ancestors, phytocetaceans have a more animal-like form of reproduction. Rather than having haploids do all the work of reproduction, they instead just release gametes into the water through the ventral gonopore. These gametes, if lucky, will be fertilized. After hatching from the egg, the first stage of a phytocetacean's life resembles the early phytozoans. These larvae are 20 centimeters long. After spending two local years as a larva, it then develops a stomach, gains swimming appendages, grows a leaf-like structure on its back, and a new ganglia grows. Now this next stage, the juvenile, which is one meter long and resembles the ancestral phytopinniped, mostly relies on photosynthesis to get energy. During the next two years of the juvenile's life, it becomes bigger and less dependent on photosynthesis, hence why the leaf eventually becomes a dorsal fin. Now an adult, the phytocetacean spends the remainder of its life filter feeding, and its last year of life is also its mating season. Macrocetum lives south and east of Kubshai and Yama, as well as northwest of Yama. Phytocetaceans are filter feeders. However, 
However, like their phytopinniped ancestors, they do derive some of their energy from photosynthesis, though in phytostations this system of using mostly photosynthesis is getting less and less efficient. They are rather slow and swim gently in the water. With few predators rivaling it in size, phytostations like Macrocetum become large for their time. Due to them having a planktivorous lifestyle, their eyes are not so developed, but they are still used to sense danger and to get places but they are still used to sense danger and to get to places with lots of sunlight to photosynthesize. Genetic ancestor, Phytopinniped. Scientific name, Macrocetum photocetacea. Origin, Phytozoa. Lifespan, 6.9 local years. Average height, 75 centimeters. Average length, 4 centimeters. Next up is the rockfish. In the cool waters of the northern Catharian Ridge, a large fish-like organism floats along the sediment. With its strange mouth, it sucks up large quantities of sediment and rocks to filter for nutrients. With its eyes, the creature observes its surroundings as it feeds, watching for danger. This creature is called the rock eater fish, a close relative of the sea sweepers. Just as they sweep the water for planktonic organisms, the rock eater fish sweeps the seafloor for nutrients. The rock eater fish is the closest relative of the sea sweepers and the other major taxon in the order Catharia. Rock eater fish likely emerged shortly after the sea sweepers did along the Catharian ridge where they have since radiated outwards into new ecosystems. The rock eater fish shares numerous traits with sea sweepers, including its specialized oral membranes that have been formed from its ancestral tenidia. These organisms hold a very different niche to snuggle pods. However, other than dietary differences, these organisms evolved on the opposite end of the world. Pictured here, a rockfish is photographed at night looking for a new foraging spot, creature designed by lethal cuteness. The rock eater fish is a derived Catharian protozygonid that has adapted its forward-facing mouth to filter sediment as opposed to water. The rockfish has therefore undergone significant changes to its mouth and throat structure to both draw in and filter sediment. The throat of the rock eater has developed the ability to move both towards and away from the end of its mouth. The rock eater is capable of moving its throat back into its mouth to draw water and small sediment in, creating a suction motion. The rock eater has also developed the muscular structures required to seal its mouth as well, enabling it to prevent sediment and water from falling out of its mouth while it is funneled through the throat and into the stomach. Once inside, the sediment is funneled back into the mouth along with any water in its mouth. Porous membranes filter the water and sediment. Water is sent through the stomach and expelled from the body by the posterior anus, leaving the sediment and organic matter trapped in the stomach. Heavier, indigestible sediment is trapped in the foremost layers of tissue to be spat out, while digestible matter is trapped further back. The rock eater fish then spits out the heavier sediment and releases digestive fluids into its stomach to digest food. Digestive material is filtered into the bloodstream at the back end of the stomach, while the remaining material is vomited out. Interestingly, in addition to enzymes, the rock eater fish also employs chemicoids that digest inorganic matter and break it down into its constituent parts. These byproducts can then be used by the rock eater fish to synthesize its own proteins. The respiratory and circulatory system of the rock eater fish have undergone significant changes. The gill fronds are no longer located at the base of the organism, but rather on the sides. This prevents them from being trapped under the rock eater fish or being damaged by the sediment below them. Blood moving from the gills into the creature connects to a long central cavity with specialized muscular tissue surrounding it. This muscle tissue pumps the hemolymph in the central cavity in a singular direction, however it can do little more. While primitive, this system does ensure that the rock eater tissues are saturated by oxygenated hemolymph. The cavity network has thus grown much, much more complex, and most of the rock eater fish's body is permeated by small, narrow passageways transporting the hemolymph to muscles and organs. The rock eater fish has a unique fin structure among Catharians. While most of its relatives have round, medium-sized fins, the rock eater has long, bony fins equipped with a claw on each end. This claw is made of keratin surrounding a hard cartilaginous center and is mainly used for defense. These fins are supported by two bones which run down the sides of the creature near the base of the head. These bones are used as an anchor point for the fin muscles, reducing the internal stretching required to anchor the fin to the stem. The posterior stabilizing fin of the rock eater fish has dramatically increased in size and possesses a claw. This claw is significantly smaller than the one found in its four main fins and is likely only useful in kicking up loose sediment. The tail fin has also grown, However, it has seen reduction in cartilage across the outermost portions of the fin. The base of the fin is fully supported with cartilage. However, the ends of the fin are supported by two bands of cartilage, one on each side. The foremost gill fronds on the organism have all but disappeared, and all that is left of them are two small, thin hairs that are about 16 centimeters in length. Interestingly, these organs are packed with nerve endings and take a similar shape to the whiskers of carnivorans on Earth. These whiskers are used by the rock eater fish to help detect what kind of sediment is directly underneath its mouth. While its eyes remain its primary sensory organ, these whiskers help the organism determine if sediment beneath is soft enough to suck up and filter. They can also serve as an early warning system, in case a burrowing predator is beginning to come up beneath it. The rock-eating imp is a diminutive relative of the giant rock-eater and possesses a few unique anatomical features, most notably its size. 
The rock eating imp possesses far smaller pores in its filtration membranes, and actually possesses an additional gland-like structure at the very base of its throat. This gland-like structure cultivates additional chemicoids used to digest the inorganic silts that funnel into its stomach. The giant rock eater is quite different anatomically from its smaller cousin, despite sharing much of its overall anatomy with them. While it lacks any specialized glands for the purpose of digestion, the rock eater actually cultivates a significantly greater variety of chemicoids within its stomach and throat, which it cultivates directly in the folds of its porous membranes. The rock eater also possesses additional nerve endings with its muscles lining the stomach, as well as additional muscle structures along the organ, enabling it to perform physical digestion to some degree. The lining of the stomach is far tougher as a result. While this system of physical design is not efficient enough to grind larger stones into digestible powder, those get regurgitated. It is enough to aid the digestion of slightly larger stones and expose more surface area to the chemicoids that it maintains in a symbiotic relationship with itself. All members of genus Rakosari are diploid hermaphrodites and develop one male and one female gonad. While both members of the genus employ seasonal mating in the far northern and southern regions of their range, they lack this quality in the equatorial regions. Rock eater fish know when it is time to mate due to a small gland in their brain that is connected to the small vestigial remnants of primitive eyes running along the sides of the organism. These light sensitive cells cannot aid in vision, however, however, they do allow the rock eater fish to undergo hormonal responses to the changes in the length of the day. These signals are transmitted to this gland in the brain and are called neurocircadia, which can then combine this information with visual input from the eyes. Interestingly, the neurocircadia also has the ability to keep track of the passage of time based on lighting cues and can keep a basic record of recent lighting and temperature conditions. When conditions are deemed favorable, for several days or weeks in succession, the neurocircadia triggers a release of reproductive hormones, triggering activation of the gonads and a mating response in the rock eater. V. trifona mates during the middle of the local spring near the polar regions. However, in the equatorial portions of its habitat, it is able to mate numerous times throughout the year. When it comes time to mate, the rock eating imp begins to secrete pheromones which diffuse into the water and can be detected by other fertile rock eaters. The rock eating imps will gather in large schools of 30 to 40 and gather in an area with very soft sediment. The imps will then dig shallow holes in the seafloor, lay their eggs in clutches of 15 to 35, after which they will move to another cluster of eggs and fertilize them. Once this process is complete, they will bury the eggs and the school will disperse. The megalostoma, the giant rock eater, employs a slightly different strategy than its smaller cousin in reproduction. Giant rock eaters mate in the midsummer near the poles and in equatorial regions they mate all year round. Much like their cousins, the rock-eating imp, the giant rock-eater releases pheromones into the water to attract mates. However, unlike their impish cousins, giant rock-eaters do not gather into large schools to mate, nor do all giant rock-eaters secrete pheromones. In order for a giant rock-eater to secrete pheromones, it must have crossed a specific size threshold, approximately 1.2 meters, and be sufficiently well-nourished. The vast majority of rock-eaters will not secrete pheromones, and will instead journey towards those giant rock-eaters who do. Rarely will this journey go unimpeded by other rock eaters, and occasionally fights do break out with competing rock eaters using their hard lateral fins and claws to attack their rival. Eventually, a pair of giant rock eaters will form and dig two small holes. Each will lay their eggs in a hole and fertilize the other's eggs before dispersing to mate again if able. Vitrophona, the rock eating imp, eggs incubate for approximately five to seven local days. During this time, the buried egg supports the developing juvenile with a small yolk, which provides sustenance and oxygen to the embryo. After the egg hatches, a naiad emerges as a smaller version of the adult. The naiad digs itself out of the sediment using its lateral fins, and once it emerges, it swims up through the water column. The young naiad will swim upwards until it is at least 2-4 to four meters above the benthic layer, where it is safer from the smaller benthic predators that would otherwise feed on them. One of the only notable differences between the naiad and the adult is that the naiad lacks the chemicoids that help the adults digest inorganic substances. Largely because of this reason, the naiad chooses to feed on plankton in the shallow pelagic zone for the first few days of life until they can attain a slightly larger size, usually around 10 centimeters, over the course of about 5 to 10 local days. Once they accomplish this, they will journey back down to the benthic layer and take their first gulp of sediment. In doing so, they will gather the first of the chemicoids that are essential to their species' digestive system. The chemicoids will rapidly colonize the juvenile's digestive tract and will form a symbiotic relationship with it for the rest of the rock-eating imp's life. The imp will continue to grow until it reaches approximately 25 centimeters, which usually takes about 14 to 24 local days. Once it reaches this phase of life, the rock-eating imp will be fully developed and able to reproduce. When the conditions are correct, such as reaching the local early spring or being in favorable equatorial waters, the young will undergo a mating response and begin the cycle anew. V. megalostoma, the giant rock-eater, employs a similar strategy to its relative. However, due to its larger adult size, it undergoes longer developmental periods. However, this is not true for the incubation phase, which lasts 5-7 to seven local days, much like its smaller relative. 
From this egg, a small dyad no longer than 4 centimeters hatches and begins to dig itself up out of the sediment. When the dyad is able to dig itself from the nest, it will begin to swim along the seafloor. Unlike its smaller relative, the giant rock eater's naiad is born large enough to filter the fine sediment near where it hatched. As a result, the naiad does not need to swim upward into the water column and will instead rely on its vision and sheltered areas to detect and avoid predators, respectively. As a result of this difference in lifestyle, the giant rock eater is able to build its colonies of chemicoids far earlier on and will benefit from a more efficient digestive system early in life. However, it will also have to contend with increased predation. Overall, at least half of all naiads will die in this phase due to predation alone. The rock eater continues to grow its entire life, however its growth rate slows significantly as it approaches a meter in length, a size it is likely to reach after 4-8 to eight weeks. Around this time, its gametes begin to develop, and once this development is completed, the juvenile is considered an adult. Vitrophona, the rock-eating imp, has a very small range. In fact, the smallest out of any Catharian. The small range is due to the dependence of the rock-eating imp on very shallow waters, something that is a rarity in its evolutionary home on the Catharian ridge. The only reason that the secondary ridge was able to be colonized was mainly due to luck, as some fortunate drifters were able to reach the ridge before starvation set in at the end of their filter-feeding phase. However, due to genetic drift being magnified, this population has diversified into a secondary subspecies, which is smaller and able to supplement its normal diet with filter feeding. Due to its smaller size, the rock eating imp can only feed on soft sediment with smaller grains. As a result, it is able to successfully engage in niche partitioning with a giant rock eater, which can feed on heavier sediment with larger particles. V. megalostoma, the giant rock eater, has a far larger range than its relative, as it developed a reproductive strategy that allows it to cease its dependence on being able to swim up and down the water column. As a result, they have begun spreading all across Almaisha, wherever it is shallow enough for the planktonic organisms living amongst the sediments to survive. While they are not yet present globally, they have continued to spread slowly across the planet. This advance has been slowed by increased predation and competition along the western coast of Yama and the yama Kupshai reef system, and increases in the concentration of sulfur in the water closer to nylon. Vitrophona, the rock-eating imp, mainly relies on softer sediment with smaller particles close to the photic zone. The sediment is rich in organic material, and easy to digest, allowing the rock-eating imp to simply consume small clumps at a time. This also allows it to niche partition with the giant rock-eaters, which prefer heavier sediment that may or may not be as rich in organic material. V. megalostoma, the giant rock-eater, is a far less picky eater in comparison to the rather small rock-eater imp. Due to its larger size, it is able to consume larger clumps of sediment, including sediment with larger grains. As a result, it has evolved to be a far less picky eater and can eat almost any form of sediment so long as it is fine enough grain to consume, that contains photoclayer organisms small enough to digest. In places where it shares its ecosystem with the rock-eating imp, it will generally avoid the finer sediment to avoid competition with the rock-eating imp, preferring the uncontested coarse sediment. The rock-eater fish relies primarily on its camera-type eyes to see the world around it. Its eyes are organized into two pairs, each on the lateral sides of the heads. The pairs are distantly spaced, giving it a wide range of view. However, unlike their fellow Catharians, the sea sweepers, the rock eater fish cannot perform stereopsis. Instead, its brain estimates the depth based on color cue, size, and movement. This method is not as accurate as stereopsis, however, it allows the rock eater fish to guess how close a potential predator is to within enough accuracy to flee, at least so long as it or the predator is actively in motion. The eyes of the rock eater fish also possess cone cells susceptible to the blue light in the spectrum. This allows the rock eater fish to differentiate between blue ocean around them and the animals in sediment. In addition to this, the rock eater fish's optical center in their brains have split into four sections each of which corresponds to its nearest eye. These portions of the optical brain both control the muscles that move the eyes and process the information. These sections are connected to a central mass of nerves, which also connects this portion to the rest of the brain. Thus, the rock eater fish is able to move all of its eyes independently, allowing it to see a far greater range of vision with greater precision than most other organisms at this time are capable of. The portion of its brain that detects motion in the rock eater fish has swelled considerably in comparison to its ancestors. As a result, the rock eater fish can quickly detect movement. When doing so, it will usually lock onto the object with one of its eyes until it can determine what caused the disturbance. Another key adaptation of the rock eater fish is its repurposing of its two front gill fronds into whisker-like feelers. With the use of these whiskers, it can detect sediment directly below it, which also serves to let the rock eater fish know that it is positioned correctly to suck up loose sediment. In doing so, in doing so, the rock eater fish enables itself the ability to continue to use its eyes to look out for predators while it feeds. The rock eater fish rely on several species of chemicoids to help them assimilate inorganic material into their biomass. Another species that it relies on is the mycoid, which helps to digest detritus and convert it into assimilable material. The basic combination of these different organisms varies from organism to organism, and different species, mycoids and chemicoids, are far more common in rock eater imps by percentage of symbiotic microbes. However, all of these organisms are present within the digestive tract of all rock eaters. This symbiotic relationship is essential to the rock eater's survival, and without them, the genus would surely go extinct. 
Genetic ancestor, Xenoyuli kirby. Scientific name, Brachiosauri species. Origin, Xenosegmenta. Lifespan, Feature Fauna, 10 local years. V. Megalostoma, 30 local years. Average height, V. Trifona, 6 cm. V. Megalostoma, 20 cm. Average length, V. Trifona, 30 cm. V. Megalostoma, 1 meter. Now we come to the Romulopede. On a sunny day along the estuary riverbanks of western Kubshai, there lay the limp body of a deceased barrel dactyl. One of the first visitors to the carcass is a small cockroach like creature emerging from the crevices of a nearby boulder as it is enticed by the smell of carrion. It darts erratically towards the source of the rotten stench, before clambering on top of the carcass and beginning to feed. Soon others converge to feast, as this is too much for only one animal to feed on, as pictured here. Romulopedes are small terrestrial generalists that are found ubiquitously around sources of brackish fresh water. Their long legs and flat body gives them the mobility and nimbleness to evade predators and hide among narrow spaces. Romulopedes belong to a group of molting xenosegmentans known as ectisopods, which also includes the sister group Ramipedes. Creature design by Squidum. The ancestors of Romulopedes experience duplicate segmentation of the last segment, adding an additional three segments to the posterior end. Tagmosis merged the anterior two segments into the head, while the remaining four segments were grouped together into the abdomen. This has thus formed the basic body plan of the Romulopede. The overall body of a Romulopede is flat, with an exoskeleton of keratin that covers the entire body. The limbs are jointed and very long in comparison with the rest of the body, being positioned laterally and ending in a single tiny claw. The head contains two pairs of compound eyes, with the anterior pair being the largest and oriented laterally. The posterior pair is slightly smaller and is oriented dorsally. The mandibles are pointed with slight serrations, and flanking the mandibles are a pair of pedipalps lined with sensory setae. In place of gill fronds, a tracheal system has developed to facilitate respiration, with the spiracle situated laterally on the ventral side of the abdomen. A stomach cavity is situated within the head, while the intestines extend down the abdomen. Romulopedes possess an open circulatory system with a tubular heart along the dorsal side of the thorax, as well as a simple nervous system composed of a rudimentary brain at the head and two ganglia trailing down the abdomen. Romulopedes are sequential hermaphrodites and are all born females. At around 1.5 local years of age, Romulopedes will undergo a final molt in a female-to-male transition, making them males for the rest of their lives. Romulopedes mate by orienting themselves opposite to each other, such that their cloacae touch together to facilitate sperm transfer. Females then lay eggs within a shallow body of water usually around crevices of a rock or retinal fight stems. Females are also able to lay parthenogenic eggs, if no males are present within the vicinity. Romulopedes begin life in their aquatic larval form during the first part of their life cycle. Larvae hatch at 0.5 cm in length and are anatomically similar to adults, except for the presence of gill fronds on the abdomen of the larva. A larva's exoskeleton is a flexible cuticle that is much softer than the exoskeleton of later instars. At 30 local days of age and reaching 2.5 cm in length, the Romulopede larvae emerge onto land and molt for the first time serving as a transition to their fully terrestrial adult form. After the first molt, a tracheal system would have developed in place of the now vestigial gill fronds. The appendages continue to shrink in size every molt until they disappear completely by the third molt. From this point on, the Romulopede needs to continue molting in order to grow larger, at least until their final molt. This is initiated by a slit forming laterally on the dorsal portion of the old exoskeleton, through which the newly molted Romulopede crawls out. Romulopedes have the ability to regenerate wounds and regrow lost limbs through molting but after each molt, the new exoskeleton needs some time before becoming fully hardened. Molting of the terrestrial instar occurs roughly every seven local days. By the third molt, the Romulopede enters sexual maturity and is a fertile female. At the seventh molt, the Romulopede enters an infertile intersex stage as its internal anatomy begins sexual transition. By the eighth and final molt, the Romulopede emerges as a fertile adult. Romulopedes inhabit the western side of Kubshai, never found far from sources of fresh water. While the adults are able to survive on land, their larval form is aquatic, and therefore they must return to the water to ovulate. As omnivorous opportunists, the Romulopedes will eat any retinal fights and carrion they can reach and consume. If sufficiently starved, one may attempt to prey on smaller organisms, even resorting to cannibalism of smaller Romulopedes. Though they possess a light exoskeleton and high agility, they are regularly preyed upon by many terrestrial predators. The compound eyes of the Romulopedes' head provide decent vision capacities, along with a wide field of view, allowing the Romulopede to react quickly to approaching predators. The setae of the pedipalps are capable of picking up olfactory cues by taste and smell. Smaller, invisible setae lining the whole body can also sense disturbances in air currents, potentially caused by movement of larger creatures. Genetic ancestor, Ypresi. Scientific name, Platygaster heri. Origin, Xenosegmenta. Lifespan, 2 local years. Average height, 3 centimeters. Average length, 7 centimeters. Well, now we have our penultimate entry, the Xenomycorrhizans. While the chemicoid lineage was adapting into forms of microbial organisms based on chemosynthesis, 
Other mycozoans were evolving into large networking forms that made better use of their ability to assimilate biomass. With the devastation of coastal ecosystems, large populations of mycoids surged to exploit the abundance of detritus matter. As a result of this explosion, some forms of mycoids adapted to form long, networking chains of cells designed to collect nutrients over greater areas. Some of these organisms in particular began to specialize for life underground, choosing to live beneath the sediment rather than on its surface. These organisms developed massive colonial networks of root systems designed to collect nutrients that were otherwise unavailable to other mycoids, plants and scavengers alike. This has led to other developments, such as symbiotic relationships with rebounding phytozoans and the development of specialized structures for reproduction. In particular, the advent of symbiosis with plant-like organisms of Almaysia has led to this group of mycozoans being named Xenomycorrhiza. Pictured here, a stand of Xenomycorrhiza fruiting bodies are seen. The underground roots of the organisms are competing with Sargrasso, and so the two organisms are both found only in patches. However, this is only around the fruiting bodies. Elsewhere, the hyphae of the Xenomycorrhiza will intertwine with the root structures and together make nutrient sharing more efficient for both organisms. Creature Design by Lethal Cuteness Xenomycorrhizans are colonial mycoid organisms that primarily grow underneath the sediment. The vast majority of a xenomycorrhizans biomass consists of web-like networks of long tubular structures bearing resemblance to the shape and form of the ancestral mycoid species. The cilia have been replaced by additional finer tubular growths that create an almost feathery appearance of the network, hyphae. These ends are tipped with diploid cells which divide to create new outgrowths. Out of the two cells, the innermost ones will usually divide into haploid cells, which consist of the bulk of the organism. However, occasionally this does not occur, resulting in an isolated diploid cell. This diploid cell will form a new outgrowth, thus creating a new branch of the tubular networking structure. Occasionally, a branch of the structure will begin to move towards the surface of the sediment. When this occurs, trace amounts of chlorophyll within the cell will trigger a photosensitive response. The resulting divisions create a small stem shooting out of the sediment capped with a small bud, which is usually in the form of a sphere, teardrop, or hemisphere. This organ is the primary node for reproduction, and the bud mainly consists of diploid cells as opposed to the usual haploid cells. These buds often possess pigmentation of some sort, usually red, green, orange, brown, or violet. The interior of the tubular structure mainly consists of long tubes running all through the organism, which are used as transportation in order to move nutrients throughout the network, and most importantly, to the bud, which is unable to collect organic material for itself. In a symbiotic system, these tubes, called mycelium, will also extend into the roots of nearby phytozoans and connect to a vascular system within their primitive roots and stems. Xenomycorrhizans include both haploid and diploid cells. While the majority of their biomass consists of haploid cells, cells involved in rapid growth at the end of the individual tubes of the mycelium, diploid cells multiply by stretching out into great lengths before splitting in two. Afterwards, the rear diploid cell performs the same process almost immediately, but much more rapidly and without expending resources to clone its DNA, resulting in two long haploid cells. This process is how cellular reproduction occurs within the organism, and how it grows the bulk of its biomass. In the event of a photosensitive response to sunlight, the xenomycorrhizin will synthesize enzymes to aid in the production of a bud. These enzymes control gene expression and ensure that the gamete development is successful. The mycelium strand that protruded into the sun develops a small, round bud at the tip. The bud is translucent white at first, however, it rapidly begins to develop pigmentation as it grows. As the bud swells, the supporting mycelium strand will elongate and thicken, creating a protruding structure resembling a lollipop or mushroom, depending on the shape of the bud. All cells within the bud are diploid, however much of the stem will remain haploid. Once construction of functional spores is complete, usually taking around 10 to 15 local days, haploid spores are produced within the bud to be used in reproduction. Sexual reproduction occurs when two strands of mycelium from different xenomycorrhizans collide. When this occurs, when this occurs a set of single chromosomes is produced by both cells, and the two begin to merge. Next, the new chromosomal sets created for the purpose are combined in between both cells and will form the nucleus of the third cell that will develop in the space between the two original cells. This third cell will develop its own mycelium network and eventually a bud at the surface, propagating its genome and contributing to the genetic diversity of the species. The xenomycorrhizan spores are usually released upon disturbance by another organism, such as a nearby rockfish, or when the buildup of spores has neared the maximum capacity of the bud. When either condition occurs, the spores are ejected en masse into the water, where they will drift until they encounter a suitable landing site. When the spore lands on sediment of the seafloor, it will begin to rapidly grow into a long tubular structure, moving inwards towards the ground. This initial strand of mycelium will anchor the xenomycorrhizan to the seafloor, and will collect the nutrients required to stimulate the organism's growth. As the organism gains nutrients, it will begin to grow its first bud. This bud contains the initial haploid genome, However, due to an additional cellular division at the upper end of the strand, the bud of this organism contains paired chromosomes, becoming diploid. The mycelium of the organism will continue to develop into a large network under the surface, and will likely create numerous other buds. Because of the nature of xenomycorrhizan biology, an 
individuals, you know, mycorrhizae, could theoretically live forever. In practice, however, environmental conditions and overcrowding by other xenomycorrhizans will eventually result in all diploid cells of the original colony dying, and this, in tandem with older cells within the organism, will eventually lead it to succumbing to death. Xenomycorrhizans live mainly in the yama Kubshai major reef system, and both species can be found dotting the shallow waters around Kubshai. Beyond this, the two species of xenomycorrhiza each have different ranges based upon their unique adaptations. Xenomycorrhiza yamanensis is named so due to the large population found along the coast of Yama. However, its range is far greater than this. X. yamanensis can be found across the entire reef system, as well as along the coastlines of all three continents and the Catharian Ridge. X. nilanensis, however, thrives in a very different environment. While it shares its habitat with X. yamanensis around the coastline of Kubshai, its range also extends to the shores of Nylon, where the species thrives. This is due to the symbiotic nature of X. nilanensis and chemocoids. X. nilanensis has evolved a pocket-like structure along its mycelium that contains colonies of chemocoids. X. nilanensis provides minerals from the ground, and in turn the chemocoids synthesize assimilable materials into X. nilanensis, which can then be traded with phytozoans for glucose. It is worth noting that both species can be found in the interior regions of Kubshai, with X. nilanensis being found in the interior regions of Nilan as well. Additionally, these organisms are not particularly common at present, thus findings of xenomycorrhiza are somewhat rare. Xenomycorrhiza require organic compounds in an assimilable form, and as a result are mainly detrivorous in nature. Large networks of mycelium are used to collect organic compounds to fuel metabolism. Digestive enzymes are excreted from the mycelium into the sediment to digest and bind to nutrients, which are then absorbed into the mycoid. Further, mycorrhiza, symbiosis with phytozoans, is becoming increasingly more common, as more xenomycorrhizans have found a niche supplying these autotrophs with nutrients that are essential for photosynthesis in exchange for glucose and other assimilable organic material. While xenomycorrhizans lack eyes or a proper nervous system, cells do possess the ability to detect and respond to stimuli, mainly through the use of two mechanisms. The first of these mechanisms are trace amounts of chlorophyll that are present within the xenomycorrhizan cell. The presence of this chlorophyll is not enough to photosynthesize, however it is enough to detect the presence of light radiation and is used to detect when a tubular structure has reached the surface. Secondarily, xenomycorrhizans also possess the ability to use chemical and electrical signals sent between the cells as a means of responding to stimuli locally such as increasing toxin production to ward off predators. These sensory abilities are equivalent to those found in Chemocoidea, indicating that the two mutually share a more recent common ancestor than with any other mycoid descendant. Xenomycorrhizans are known symbionts with several phytozoan species, the most notable of which is the Sigmata tail. The symbiosis between these two species has helped to propel both of them to populate numerous portions of Almaecia's photic zones. Genetic ancestor? Mycoid. Scientific name? Xenomycorrhiza species. Origin? Phytozoa. Lifespan? Singular mycorrhizan cells, about 60 local days. A singular bud, 6 local years. Entire colony, indefinite. Average height, bud, 2 to 20 centimeters. Roots, 1 to 10 millimeters in thickness. Average length, bud, 3 to 25 centimeters at widest point. Root, varies depending on environmental conditions. Maximum length of about 8 to 10 meters. And last but certainly not least, we come to Xenopistris. In the vast ocean of Almaecia and away from the shallows of the reefs and coastlines is the domain of what some would refer to as the queen of the waves. Xenopistris. Large and streamlined, Xenopistris is the bane of many large-bodied filter feeders who have arisen due to the bloomer populations that caused the mass extinction. As one of the few carnivores that have survived into this time, Proboscognathids were in a prime position to claim the top spot in the oceanic food chain. Xenopistris is one of the more specialized descendants to have evolved as heavily armored pursuit predators. Pictured here, sensing blood in the water, a shoal of Xenopistris have congregated in hopes of a small but easy meal. Creature designed by Saurus Blooded and Sean. Xenopistris has become more specialized to open ocean life than its ancestor, Proboscognathid. The head tagma has become more compact, with the chalicerae becoming a three-pronged pseudo-jaw responsible for capturing and masticating prey. This beak-like jaw is still used to masticate food, but the muscles controlling it are much weaker. The three eye stalks are retractable to help reduce drag during pursuit. The modified spike paddles of the ancestral Proboscognathid have become small and vestigial, only truly used as chemoreceptors for detecting prey in the open ocean. The purple gillifrils are no longer ringed around the gaps between the tagmata. They are now only present ventrally as to reduce drag when Xenopristris is swimming. The second and third tagma have begun to develop a dorsal spine that is somewhat reminiscent of a dorsal fin to help prevent Xenopistris from rolling as it swims at faster speeds. Segments 2, 3, and 4 have adapted their flippers to be more rigid while segment 5 has completely lost its flippers and is dedicated to propelling the organism forward. Segment 6 has developed into a large flattened fin-like tail that is used to propel the Xenopistris through the water and chase down prey. It still ends in the Xenopistris cloaca. Xenopistris are sequential hermaphrodites. They begin life as males who live in schools in the shallows around Yama and Kubshai, eagerly awaiting the large ocean roaming females. 
When a female is ready to lay eggs, she will move into shallow waters and release a pheromone from her cloaca to attract a school of males. Once the males have located her, the female will begin digging a shallow hole with her tail and lay 5-10 to 10 eggs, onto which the males will quickly begin spreading their gametes. The female will then return to the deeper water while the male covers the eggs in sediment. Xenopistrus emerge from their eggs as male miniature versions of the adults and will, and will school with their siblings. They will feed on smaller organisms until they have grown to 1.5 meters in length and become fertile. On average, this will take 1-2 to two local years. The fertile male phase stops growing until they reach 5 local years old, when they leave their schools and enter the open ocean and begin their transition into a female. During this time, their bodies will grow quickly over the course of two local years and become fertile females. Xenopistrus primarily live in the open ocean of Almaysia, feeding on the large filter feeders that they prefer. They prefer to live in warmer waters, but can be found in cold waters from time to time. Males and nesting sites tend to be found around the southern tips of Yama and Kubshai. Xenopistrus is exclusively carnivorous and specializes on hunting larger filter feeders, such as earth jellies and sacocassus. The preferred prey of the males is young Magnusfina and Megacaris, but any slow-moving prey will do. Like its ancestor, Xenopistrus has three pupils for each eye, allowing it a wider range of vision as it is more of a visual hunter. The sensory horn-like panels have become vestigial and reduced in size, though they are still used for chemoreception. Genetic ancestor, Probosognathid. Origin, Xenosegmenta. Scientific name, Xenopristrus grisio. Lifespan, 20 local years. Average height, 120 centimeters. Average length, 500 centimeters. Body tint, Xenopistrus exhibits countershading with its dorsal side being black or dark gray in color and the ventral side being white in color. The gill frills were light purple like the ancestral proboscognathid. All right, well, that's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed this. There are still a lot of creatures for phase four to go. It's going to take a while to get through them. I'm happy this one did not take over a month to get out. Please, if you like this video, give it a like. If you didn't, give it a dislike and tell me what you didn't like about it. Maybe you didn't like the Latin at the beginning. I don't know. I just thought it would be funny. Either way, please do subscribe to the channel so that way you're notified when there's more Dapper Dino stuff. But if you really want to be notified, you have to make sure to hit the bell icon and then turn on all notifications. Because apparently, YouTube thinks that you subscribing means literally nothing. And finally, here's a word from my sponsors, my patrons and channel members. I just want to take a second to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 and above. Bob Knob, Bent Hoven, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bede, Patrick Dennis, and Res Instance. My channel members and patrons help make this channel possible, and without their support, this channel really wouldn't exist. If you would like to help support the channel as a member or patron, there are links in the description to both join the channel as well as join the Patreon. Patrons and members get mentioned in these credit scenes, as well as getting early access to my scripted videos, and if you pledge $10 or above, you can also get access to various 3D assets that I create for Blender, both for use in the channel, as well as just general giveaways to my supporters to help in any Blender projects they might have. If a monthly or annual pledge isn't for you, then there is also a merch store linked to the description. And if none of that's right for you, please just like and subscribe because every like and subscription really helps the video out. Thank you.